You know that most live events leave the climax till the end. Can't claim to be the climax, but I hope to keep you a little bit amused for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. What I intend to do is show some of the, the things that would push you towards accessibility, but also show some of the solutions. But first, I want to maybe go back over some of uh, what has already been said and maybe reiterate them because some of them are well worth reiterating. Fifth Quadrant Analytics reckoned that there are 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world. That's about the population of India. And they also say that they're about, they have between them and those who are most emotionally associated with them, $8 trillion of disposable income annually. What do they mean by emotionally associated? They mean family, close friends, close colleagues. If you think about it, if I've got a son who's a wheelchair user, he or she would probably have half a dozen close friends in school. So if we're going to go for a birthday party, whatever, I will choose somewhere that's accessible and all of those go along to that accessible event. But also, if any of them are going to have a birthday party and they want to bring my son in who's a wheelchair user, they will also choose the accessible option. And that continues right through the person's life as they go to their workplace, their workmates, if they want to have a party, they will make sure that the place is accessible to accommodate this wheelchair users. Same within families. So it is worth keeping in mind that accessibility and disability affects an entire family and, and an entire uh, group of people and not just one person. The um, Accenture and IAAP report called uh, Getting to Equal, which was produced on the 3rd of December, just around 18 months ago, said that there were $490 billion of disposable income around accessibility in the USA alone. And even in, even in a small country like Ireland, we reckon that there's about 640,000 people with disabilities. As we heard earlier, one in six, one in seven, depending, depending on how you measure it. We've, I'm not going to repeat all the things that say why you want to include these. We've heard it all before. But it's worth mentioning. Next slide, please. I work with Bank of Ireland and I wanted to talk briefly about just what Bank of Ireland is doing around accessibility. We have six inclusion and diversity networks. Accessibility is one of those we've got with pride and we've got intergenerational and so on, so on. I'm not going to go into them now, but accessibility is just one of those six networks. Within our own network, the accessibility network of which I'm chair, we have four what we call pillars. Communication, digital, environment, and people. Each of those has a different view of the organization and the people who work with it and the customers that we serve. And each of those tries to address those issues. And then we come together as a network to say, well, what is the overall view? And I think that's a good thing. Rather than just having one big organization or one big group of people, try to give people something that they can concentrate on, something that they know well. And that works well in our organization. We also have external scrutiny, so we don't just uh, do it the way that we think it should be done. Our financial regulator in Ireland demands that we uh, include inclusion and diversity in, in all our activities. So that's there as an external scrutiny. But we also have the Business Disability Forum. This is a British organization which a load of uh, particularly financial organizations are members of. Bank of Ireland is a member of it. They have what they call a standard on accessibility, and you have to go and um, fill in over 100 questions with evidence, and then they will say, yes, you're an accessible organization, or no, you're not. So it's worth having a look at the uh, Business Disability Forum, see what facilities they have and supports they have for you if you're a member, and even some supports if you're not. Next slide. So what, apart from the uh, number of people involved, what are the other requirements which might make you look at accessibility? The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Britain has is, is, uh, signed, has ratified it. Ireland has, in fact, all 28 countries in Europe. For now, I'm including the UK. 
as being in the EU. We won't go into that one, but all 28 countries have, and um, it's over 100 countries worldwide have, have ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. There's the European Disability Act coming up. There's the accessibility of public uh, um, public organisations directive. There's the audiovisual media services directive. There are all these directives which say this is what you need to do and gives you a lot of pointers as to how to go about this. In Ireland, of course, we have our own uh, equality legislation like the Employment Equality Act of 1998. So Britain has its own legislation, which is actually very good and very strong. So there's plenty of read there, there if you like the stick. But uh, let me move on because I want to move on fairly quickly to the carrot and how do you do it? What accessibility supports are there? There are international and European standards. There are loads of them. In Europe, we have EN 301549, which is about the accessibility of digital media, digital te uh, technology in general. Uh, earlier on, we heard about BS 8878, which is a British uh, standard, which does something fairly similar. There are a load of other standards out there which are of great support. I don't have time to go into them now, but they are there, they are available, and they are supports. I think most people are familiar with the W3C guidelines, uh, particularly the uh, WCAG guidelines, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They have now been adapted as ISO 40500, so they are an international standard. But don't forget that the WCAG also has standards on how you build a browser, uh, author, uh, authoring tools and other other areas. And they're moving more so in towards how do you make mobile apps accessible and that sort of stuff. So keep an eye on W3C. They go way beyond just WCAG. They go way beyond that. Universal design inclusive design, some people would call them. They're not quite the same, but they're close to each other. And uh, in Ireland, we have the, un the uh, Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, which has a very, very, very good global um, recognition for it does. So if you want to just look at universaldesign.ie, they have plenty of guidelines. They have, a, they have an Irish standard on communication with organisations to support the needs of people with disabilities. At the base of universal design is two things. One, build it in from the design stage. It's much cheaper and easier than to retrospect. But two, ask the people who are going to use it. Ask the users. Nothing about us without us. The people who know best what is required are the people who are living that experience of disability on a daily basis. So ask them, they'll know. Don't wait till it comes to testing phase. When it comes to the testing phase, usually it's too late because at that stage, most of the work is done. You, you end up, if you find a problem, that is a large amount of retrospective uh, uh, fixing of things, which you don't want. Universal design is wonderful. In the national, international MOOCs and guidelines, a MOOC is a massive online open course. In other words, it's an online learning course, but there are several MOOCs which were set up between the European Union and the USA, ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, and various other people. So they tend to be international in their nature, they tend to be free, and they tend to, that you can do them anytime that you like. So you do them in your own time. You start when you when it suits you. They finish when they suit you. And we can make a list of MOOCs available to, to participants here. There are a few of them which are well worth checking out. And the other thing, rather than reinventing the wheel and you want to include accessibility, it's very strongly uh, advised to look at what has already been done by others. Why reinvent the wheel? So the way to do that, the IAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, have set up courses 
and professional qualifications, which people can study for, can qualify for, and then are available. And of course, organizations, industries, colleges, whatever else, know that these people know the standards and aren't making it up off the top of their heads. They know the standards, they know the way they're done, they know what has worked in the past, they know what should work in the future. So use people who know what they're talking about. That sounds obvious, but it's so often not done. And as I say, what that allows you to do is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It, what it also does is that if you, uh, if you are you're, as an organization are using international recognized standards and there are people out there who have qualified them, it's easy to incorporate them into your organization. You don't have to start teaching these people. This is the way we do things around here because the way we do things around here is the best international standards. So it's easier to transfer people internally and to get people in if you are using standards which are internationally recognized. Let's look at the future because we with people with this as people with disabilities can change things. Organizations can change things, but there are a lot of things out there which we, if I could call myself a small guy, even though I'm six foot two, can't change. So I want to look for just for a minute, what are the future and what technologies might converge to improve things for the to, to improve accommodating the needs of people with disabilities? So there are new materials being designed all the time. For instance, graphene. We're all we're all familiar with graphite, which is what goes into your pencil. Graphene is something similar, except that maybe a thickness of one or two atoms. It's stronger than steel, conducts electricity better than metal, but it's tremendously light and tremendously strong. So you could imagine a wheelchair, we say, built of graphene. Imagine that, how light it would be, how nimble it would be. Magnificent. It's not commercially available yet because it still, still costs too much to develop, but it's coming. AI and machine learning, that's the future of technology. It's where, where there's the degree of learning involved. And I'm going to talk about that a little in a minute, but let's just say that it is there, it is developing. And as machines get smarter, they can incorporate more accessibility, more easier. And we heard a lot about that from a lot of the presenters already today. Internet of things. So as things are connected, they can be controlled. And if, for instance, like myself, who's blind, I can't control my fridge or my washing machine or my dishwasher, but if they're all connected to the Internet of Things, I can pick up my mobile file and I can control them through that. I can control my television through the same device. And the, the thing, the good thing from my point of view is that instead of having to learn the human interface for the fridge through its app on the web, and then I have to learn the uh, human interface for the app for my washing machine on the um, on the web. And they may or may not be accessible. What it means is that I have one device, one thing that I need to know how to control, and it then talks through APIs to, to the, uh, the app that's controlling the fridge or the washing machine, the dishwasher or the television. It makes life so much easier and so much uh, simpler for the user. Robotics. I had a, a very strange um, Facebook message there recently from somebody in Japan who was looking for finance, not for me, just in general, for an assistive robot. So we're used to assistive dogs, guide dogs and that sort of stuff. But robotics are getting to a stage now where they are beginning to be used in certain limited areas as assistive devices to help people. And we could see in the future as AI goes into robots that they will become smarter, they'll be able to do more, they'll be able to be uh, more assistive in more different situations. Robotics are coming and we need to be there to make sure that our needs are taken into account. To have AI work really, really well, you need smarter and quicker computers and the future of that is quantum computing. 
the first uh, properly working quantum computer was made available about 10 years ago, 2010 at this stage. But the big problem with quantum computers, or one of the big problems, is that they're very volatile and they have to operate at just a couple of degrees above absolute zero. And if they don't, the uh, outside atmosphere protons, something as small as a proton, can upset it. So 3D topological interlinators are, in a way, the holy grail for uh, quantum computing. What they do is they insulate from the external, so they stop protons or whatever else from getting inside, but internally they let all these wonderful fast movements take place. They are coming, they're far from perfect yet, but they're on the way. What that would do, if we get 3D, uh, if we get these insulators working, what it means is that uh, quantum computers can work at, at um, room temperature. And that immediately makes them available to industry rather than the huge enormous price that they are there. What, what, do, what do we need to do for all of these? We need to make sure that the needs of people with disabilities are taken into account. Particularly in AI, you need to include the ideas of fairness and bias. But we also need to ensure, as I was mentioned, I think by Hector earlier on, that where our needs are included in the data sets which are used to teach smart computers and to teach AI and to teach deep learning. That if, uh, what happens if you don't see? If you ever saw a robot, you'll always find that robots have uh, cameras, they have microphones, they have sensors. I wonder what would happen if you got one of your micro, uh, one of your robots which was operating under AI, you turned off the camera. How would it get on on the current uh, deep learning and AI uh, technology? Be interesting to see. We need to make sure that fairness, bias and the need, our needs are included in the data, data sets and the learning for all of those. So when all these technologies that I've already spoken about here come together, our needs are taken into account. If not, what could become our greatest allies could immediately become our greatest barriers and force even more dependence upon us. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between impairment and disability. And what uh, I already mentioned, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it is so key to everything. What it does is it differentiates between impairment and disability. It says impairment is what goes on in a person's body, so I'm blind, that's my impairment. But my disability to a large extent, or to a very much more extent, is how society doesn't accommodate my impairment. And I want to tell a story to demonstrate that rather than try to explain it. Many years ago where I worked, I lived about seven or eight miles away. But to get there, it was about three or four miles straight long road that I that I had to go along. This was before there were announcements on buses or anything else. And I used to tell the, 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 the bus driver, give me a shout at the American Embassy, please, because that was my nearest stop. And of course, he was busy. And yes, it was always he at that stage. He was so busy taking care of his work, he sometimes forgot. And of course, I sometimes remember, caught my bus stop, sometimes I wouldn't. But what happened there was it wasn't just that I was late for my work, but the people I worked with had to cover for me because early in the morning was a busy time in where I was working at the time. So people had to cover for me. And it meant that they were discommoded. My boss used to say to me, Jerry, you do brilliant work, but this coming in late in the mornings is becoming a problem. So the whole group were discommoded. And of course the bus driver would be embarrassed and all of these things. So what happened to change that? I got my hands on a GPS, an accessible GPS device. And what I did is I plugged in the address of the stop before my stop and my stop. 
I never missed my bus stop again. OK. I was just as blind or just as impaired as I had been the day before I got the GPS. But what different what was different was I was less disabled in that situation because the, uh, the, the environment has changed. So from going from an environment where you were dependent on seeing a particular building or asking somebody else to show me the building, I was able to find it, find it myself because I had this accessibility device. That's 15, 20 years ago. This technology has moved on massively, but you can see how technology takes an inaccessible situation and turns it into an accessible situation. It wasn't just me who gained, bus drivers gained, my workmates made, gained, the whole group gained, and my boss was delighted with me. I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to pass on to Andy. But before I do, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. And being Irish, I can't leave without messing up the poor old live stream by saying in Irish, Thank you or Gurav Margaret. Thank you.